Intro to Organic Chemistry. When you hear that word organic, you're probably thinking, all natural, man, no man-made chemicals. And uh, for a long time, that's what the word organic meant. It meant that the chemical, the organic chemical, came from nature, from a living thing. And scientists didn't think you could make those chemicals in the lab. They thought there was some special life force or magic or something in those chemicals because we couldn't seem to reproduce them in the lab. And then, you know, we got better at chemistry and found out, oh yeah, we can make those. And what they all have in common is carbon. Carbon is the building block for life. We'll talk more about why later. And an organic chemical is just a chemical that contains carbon. Unfortunately, the old meaning that it's all natural is still there. So when people talk about organic produce, they're not talking about does it contain carbon or not. They're talking about uh, was it grown in a natural way. But when chemists say organic, they are saying it contains carbon. The two meanings overlap a lot, but they're not completely the same. So be careful. We're going to be using the chemistry meaning in here, which means if it contains carbon, we're going to consider it organic, even though it might be man-made. A lot of organic chemicals, the simpler ones we're going to be looking at, come from crude oil. And you know, crude oil does come from living things that died about a billion years ago. But when you look at crude oil, which is disgusting and toxic, it's not usually what you think of when you think of organic. But in chemistry, it is organic. All those compounds still contain carbon. And it's a disgusting mess of stuff. And, uh, well, to make it useful, we've got to separate it. You know, it's a mixture of a bajillion things. So one way that we can separate things when they're all liquids is distillation. We're going to look at a very simple distillation here, just two chemicals. Crude oil is a mixture of a billion chemicals. We'll talk about it in a minute. But if you just had two chemicals and they were liquids and you want to separate them, one way you can do it is you can heat up the mixture. What's going to happen to this mixture of A and B as I heat it? Well, if we start at, say, room temperature, 25 degrees C, and it gets warmer and warmer and warmer, what happens when you get to 100? Well, when you get over 100, the B is going to boil. It boils at 100 degrees C. But the A is just going to sit there as long as we don't get it too hot. So we're going to have to keep the temperature between these two right here for this to work. We want to separate the liquids. So if we just boil one of them, it's going to leave and leave the other component behind. And then we don't usually want to lose the one that's vaporizing. So we capture it and we cool it down and we recondense it. And this way we can separate the two chemicals. Eventually we'll have pure A over here. So we can use distillation to separate the components in crude oil. There's gasoline in there, jet fuel, and starting materials for making plastics. There's all kinds of good stuff in there. Here's a, an oil refinery. They look very pretty at night. And you can see that oil refinery, oh, let's look at it again, has a whole bunch of tall columns here. These are called distillation columns. And the way they work is you pump your crude oil into the middle somewhere and you heat the bottom. And so it's hottest down here and coldest up here. And the crude oil is going to come in here and start dripping down. And uh, as it gets down lower, it gets hotter. Some things are going to boil and go up. And then some of the things that are boiling and going up, as it gets cooler, they're going to condense again and fall down. So let's just suppose we have some chemical in this crude oil mixture that boils at 300 degrees. Let's look at what happens to it. So the crude oil comes in here, and the A is a liquid. Up here, we're at like 200 degrees. This is the cooler end. So we come in here, it's too cold to boil, and the A is going to drip down. It's a liquid. It's getting warmer and warmer and warmer. Oh, we just got so warm right here. We're at our boiling point. And so the A is going to start to boil. It'll form vapor, and the vapor will go up. And as it goes up, it's getting cooler again. And so now it's too cold to be a vapor. It's going to start condensing and fall back down. And 
it's a liquid. Oh, oh, we get to here and it's too hot and it's going to boil again and it'll go up. And oh, too cold, it's going to form liquid and it'll fall down. And it's just going to hang right around here where the A is. If it goes up, it turns into liquid and falls down. If it falls down, it gets too hot and then it turns back into gas and it goes up. So all the A is going to be around here. All we have to do is put a little hole in the column right here and the A is just going to dribble out right at this level. So this is how we can separate lots of different chemicals that have different boiling points. It's called a distillation column. And it's very pretty. So this is how we get most of our organic chemicals for lab. Well, what is so amazing about carbon? Why is life based on carbon? Why can we make so much stuff out of carbon? You guys, carbon is unique on the periodic table. It can make four bonds which is the most bonds anybody can make, really, in the upper right-hand corner where the nonmetals are. Right underneath it, silicon can also make four bonds, but silicon can't do this, make double and triple bonds. The silicon atoms are too big so that they can't get close enough together to make double and triple bonds. So while silicon is useful, you can make glass out of it, and, you know, it makes sand on the beach and a few other things. Carbon is even more versatile. You can, because of the four bonds and the double and triple bonding, make it into rings and crosses and make branches out of it. You can pretty much make any shape out of carbon that you want, any structure, and our bodies use carbon to do this. It's like the building block for nature. Because it can make so many different things, this kind of formula, C6H14, that's the molecular formula, tells you how many atoms of each type are in the molecule. This type of formula is kind of useless in organic chemistry because there are so many different things you could make with 6 C's and 14 H's. There's a lot of different molecules that have this formula, so not that useful to us. Just for review, what would be the empirical formula here? I hope you remember that the empirical formula is the reduced one. So neither one of these formulas are very useful in organic because I can just off the top of my head think of a couple of structures for C6H14. It might be, you know, six carbons in a row with hydrogens filling out the four bonds of carbon all around here. And yeah, that's six carbons and 14 H's. I'm just counting them up to check. Yep, that's it. Or I could make a chain of five carbons and then have like a little branch here of a carbon. And again, I could fill out the four bonds that each carbon wants with H's and that's going to give me 14 H's. So these are completely different molecules. I know they don't look that different to you just yet, but they are. This one has a different name. It's called hexane and this one is called 2-methylpentane. They have different names because they are different. They have different boiling points, they have different properties, uh, but they have the same molecular formula. Mm. So the molecular formula doesn't help us too much. We really have to draw this out to show people which one we're talking about. When we say C6H14, it doesn't tell uh, a chemist much. It's like, well, do you mean hexane or do you mean methylpentane? Because we got to know. We can't just say C6H14. So these are kind of a pain to draw. They're called structural formulas. You got to show all the bonds and how everything is hooked together. Structural formulas. Because uh, people get tired of drawing them if they're organic chemists, they sometimes do something called a condensed structural formula. In this formula, you put all the C's and connect them together. And then um, instead of drawing all these H's out with little bonds, you just say, and there's three H's connected to this C. So each C, you just write next to it all the things that are hooked up to it. It's especially handy if you have to type your formula. Uh, this is way easier to do on a word processor than this thing. And... There are even more condensed, condensed structural formulas. There's this one where they don't even show dashes. I don't like it. I wouldn't do it if I were you. Especially if there are double or triple bonds in here, it can get very confusing. 
And if you're an organic chemist, you use this one. And every vertex or end is a carbon atom. <laughs> you would only use this kind of structure if you worked with this stuff all the time. Otherwise, it would get confusing. <laughs> so, uh, the other structural formula. Here's the condensed structural formula for that one. And I think that's enough for you to do your homework. And I'll talk to you some more tomorrow. Bye.